let's be quiet. Let's make sure the Lord gets the glory and that we're not trying to meddle or weasel out our hopes and desires. Let's step back and really let the Lord work. Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here joined by my lovely wife, April, who just, we just had our granddaughter. We were just talking about this. So April, you want to explain what just happened in our family? Our family. Our first granddaughter, our second grandchild, and yes. we are just over the moon. She just arrived yesterday and just got home moments ago, arrived home moments ago. So we're really happy. And the, the euphoria after having a baby, it's different when you're the grandparent than the one that just went through it. <laughs> but yeah, super excited. Yeah, so excited. And then we have today Michelle Akrami. All the way from California <laughs> and uh, Brittany Stewart all the way from Texas. So today we're going to do something a little different. Um, I want to try something new. We've been doing a lot of videos where we look at kind of a lot of contemporary ideas as being expressed through different thought leaders on YouTube and reacting and dialoguing, working through, okay, what's the family team's kind of lens? What's the biblical lens through which we can see this, this issue? Um, so, but there's another body of content that's really valuable to react to besides YouTube. And it's called the Bible. Um, and, uh, it's, it's uh, timeless and everything here, I think is really important to see through like the lens of family and motherhood. And how do we, how do we understand, uh, these things in light of the, especially the, the fascinating narratives that we have in, in the Bible. Um, so I wanted us to, to do a deep dive on a character a mother in the Hebrew scriptures. And this mother is Rebecca. Um, she's a really interesting uh, character in the Bible. So for those of you guys who might not be familiar with Rebecca, um, Rebecca was married to Isaac. So uh, Abraham and Sarah were the first kind of patriarch and matriarch of the family of Israel. And then God chose Isaac. And then there's a really beautiful story in Genesis where Isaac meets his bride, Rebecca. Uh, through um, a bunch of series of events. I'd love to do a whole conversation in Midrash on that. Um, but I wanted to talk through Rebecca and um, her role because, you know, there's there's sort of a, a really interesting tension in the story. Um, and that is that Isaac kind of is blind, both maybe spiritually and physically. He's kind of like struggling, it seems like in the story, to really understand God's will. And Rebecca is sort of trapped as this woman in this very patriarchal um, situation. And what she does to try to um, further what she thinks is the right thing for the family um, is really interesting. Um, and it doesn't, there's no sugarcoating in, this, in, the, in the Bible in this story. It's like a complex story. Um, and it, but it, it does bring to the surface a lot of questions. So I'm gonna read two passages and then um, just get your all's reaction and we'll, we'll just kind of talk through these passages. Um, they both relate to the same story. So I want to read from uh, Genesis 25 and then from Genesis 27 um, and how we're introduced to this, the character of Rebecca. So, and you guys, whatever is, is sort of stirring up and I'll try to give some context as too, as, as I'm reading, if anything feels like it might be a little bit out of, um, out of, uh, out of place, it might be hard to understand without some context. So we'll start with uh, Genesis uh, 25. I'm going to read starting verse 19. And we're going to do kind of like a Midrash style. Midrash is kind of like where we just, hey, we just riff and discuss and try to figure out both observations, um, inter interpreting, and then like, what could this mean? How do we apply these, mm -hmm. these, uh, these ideas? So Matthew, or we're looking at Genesis 25, 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, quote, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Too 
nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all of his body like a hairy cloak, so they called him his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. All right, so that's the plot line so far. And then, of course, we are, we're going to skip forward to Genesis 27 to kind of uh, fill out the rest of Rebecca's part in, in this story. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me the delicious food such as I love. And bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare me delicious food that I might eat it and bless you before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I might prepare for them from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves, and you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son, Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father, he said, Here, I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hand. hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate, and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from, his, from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that he, he may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it before you came, and I blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. And as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me even also, my, O oh my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob for he has cheated me these two times? 
He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you not one blessing, my father? Bless me even, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to him, The days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets that you have done what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? All right. <laughs> so there's a lot there. Um, but yeah, I was really interested to hear what, uh, what kinds of things struck um, any of y'all about the story of Rebecca and what she does in, in this story so far. I think it's interesting that she, um, in the womb, could tell that there was stuff going on. Um, first of all, that she was they were struggling with infertility for so long. Um, 20 years is what it sounds like. If, yep. if um, Isaac was 40 when they got married and then he was 60 when the twins were born. Wow, that's a long time to go through that. And then for her to be able to tell right away that something was going on in her womb with it being like her first pregnancy and everything. It's, that's pretty fascinating. Need a blueprint to revise your family to be a multi-generational team on mission? The book Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor is the book that summarizes all the big picture ideas you hear on this podcast. Available on Amazon or familyteams.com. Yeah. I think her initial question, um, where it says in verse 22, the babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? Instead mm -hmm. of just, why is this happening? You know? And that jumped out at me. Um, and I love that she went to inquire of the Lord, though, you know? But I don't know. There's, as a mom, you know, so much, so many times in motherhood, we can make about us, you know, and it's not always, it's not about us. And um, I don't know, that was just a question that stood out to me that she was already kind of taking that personal and like, I need to do something, you know, something like that. Yeah. I think that's so, that, that is so interesting that she asked and the, um, she got, yeah, this, this epic response that was d definitely way beyond the scope of what she was asking. She wasn't asking what mm -hmm. is the, she's like, something is happening here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it was very like, is this, this isn't personal to you. There is, there is a national, two nations are literally at war inside of your womb. <laughs> yeah. <an> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think she started off the right way, right? Like she inquired of the Lord and he told her. And then yeah. she's like, hmm. then she found out what they feel like. It was so cross-cultural, like against what the cultural norm was, that I don't think she could accept that, you know, if she could have, or it plays out. But I guess my next question would be, did she share this with Isaac? Right. Yeah, it's, a very, it's very strange in the story that it seems that Rebecca is much more tuned in to the sovereign plan of God than... Isaac is right. And mm -hmm. this is, this is what creates the tension in the story. It seems yeah. because there is no indication that she did share this with Isaac 
or if she did, that he took it to heart. Um, and so she knows while she's giving birth that whichever one is going to come out second is going to be the one mm -hmm. that is going to be the son of the promise, not the firstborn. And it doesn't seem like Isaac took that on board at all. And so, so the, the story really, you know, it, it demonstrates kind of like, cause you know, there's, there is obviously this temperamental difference between Esau and Jacob and a reason why you have one of the sons more masculine and maybe therefore getting the favor of Isaac. Whereas it seems that Rebecca has this insight about the one who's actually, um, the firstborn or the one who's the, the son of promise. And that, that might, you know, be influencing her relationships with the two boys. Well, what else, uh, what else is standing you guys out? This, this, this story. I, I just think the whole, that it's just, um, the idea of the Lord communicating something to her, um, when she's pregnant about her children, um, he gave something very clear to her, like God spoke to her. That's kind of like, wow, that's in and of itself is pretty amazing. And then, um, that she seemed to really fight for it. I mean, it's kind of what you were just saying, Jeremy, but it's like, I don't know. I mean, cause this was what, 20 years later, or we, we don't know, I guess how old the boys are, but maybe 20 ish or 18 or 22, something like that. And she's still like really clinging to this, you know, thing that she heard and basically like forcing it to happen. And, uh, maybe going around her husband or she's encouraging her. If you think about what she's doing, I've always felt conflicted with this story because she's like encouraging her son to deceive his father. And she's yeah. like is spy or like <laughs> she's getting the information and then she's going and like using her influence to like make stuff happen. And then um, I just don't know how to, how to like where to put that in my moral compass Yes. Um, because of, you know, what I think about marriage and how you should be on the same page and be, you know, supportive of your husband and that kind of thing. And so I don't know, I'm just curious about what the dynamics were, but then that she had to kind of jump through those hoops kind of says that Isaac was not really either listening when she did tell him or was kind of like had his own idea of the way things should be. And, you know, Esau being hairy, it kind of, um, like his name literally is Harry, means Harry. So it just makes you think he's like this big, buff, burly, outdoorsy kind of guy. And then, you know, that maybe that would be outward appearance look like the leader of the family or like he's going to be the one who takes on this promise. And it, it, Isaac was the one who was almost sacrificed by his father and... um understands that he has like a, a half brother um Ishmael and so I don't know like all the somewhere in there he still is not totally trusting the Lord or following what God is has communicated to them and so she has to step in and it's like admirable in some ways and like questionable in some ways I don't know yeah well th that's why I found so important about this particular narrative and and that is you have to wrestle with it. Like you can't just get some kind of blatant or obvious moral lesson. Like there is no way that I know of to splice this. Like life is really messy. And one of the things I love about the scriptures is that they really, they, they force us to wrestle with the, these challenges. And so I think, and, and as you're reading the story, and this is kind of what I wanted to ask you both, like all, all three of you just kind of get your feedback on what, what can we learn from Rebecca? Like what, how do you wrestle with this? You know, she's in a very weird dilemma. Um, she's in a, she's in this marriage. Apparently they're not co co coordinating or co cooperating. Like there's some level at which she's wanting something. And the, the part of this that always gets me for some reason is when Esau comes in and once Isaac realizes what happened, um, he trembles and mm -hmm. he says, you can't reverse this. And there's been just enormous amounts of theological, um, 
discussion around why can't Isaac reverse this blessing. Um, but I would say that like one of the possibilities that I've always thought is, you know, makes the most sense to me, I guess, is it's because he's trembling because he knows that Jacob, the blessing belongs to Jacob and he's been thwarted. Like, mm -hmm. um, this prophecy happened so early and my guess is that, that Rebecca would have said something about this to Isaac at some point, but he doesn't want to hear it. And so you think as a human being or as the leader of this family, I can, you know, my will can actually happen. And then we find out that somebody with all of the power of Isaac cannot, cannot give the blessing to whichever son he wants, that the sovereign decision or plan of God is going to thwart him. But the thing that makes this story so challenging or interesting is that it comes through his wife. <laughs> it comes through her. It's almost like she's, yeah, is she, is she, is she co cooperating with God um, mm -hmm. to give the blessing to the proper son or is what she's doing wrong and therefore God would have found another way that didn't involve any kind of deception or any kind of sort of this, what it feels like, you know, power play on the part of Rebecca. Like, this is a really difficult thing to figure out. I don't know what that stirs up or how you guys read that or, but this is where the wrestling really starts, I think. He, the well, Lord, can... he clearly told her what was going to happen. And I go back to just recently, somebody reminded me that each of my children have their own testimony. Like the Lord is writing their testimony. And I can try with all my power to manipulate it and make it go one way or the other. But they have a story. And I feel like, like she was told and she still, you know, couldn't step back and let it play out. Right. Like she maneuvered her way through so i think as a mama there's just this reminder of like even if Lord hasn't told me he told her clear as day this is the plan um i have to step back and guide my children but i have to let the lord write that testimony in their lives yeah it's not about me she kept making about her we're <laughs> over in this story so Brittany, you feel that that because God prophesied to Rebecca about what was going to happen, that clearly he doesn't need her help. And when she inserted herself to force it to happen, that was kind of crossing a line. I wonder what the story would have looked that looked like had yes. she stepped back and let let the Lord work. Yeah. Yeah, it may it not have looked her timeline, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the details that seems to possibly indicate that is the way the storyteller describes the reason for the uh, favoritism is not because Rebecca is trying to obey God, but because Jacob is a tentish person or whatever. She, he's dwelling by the tents mm -hmm. as opposed to, yeah, so that's interesting. And I, I think it's like you were saying, Jeremy, about the favoritism and how often if it's not dealt with and submitted and surrendered to the Lord, it just seems to follow down the family line, um, you know, and just seeing that play out. Um, but yeah, I, like you were saying, Brittany, I think it has to do too with um, just submission to our husband, submission to the Lord, submission to our husband. It's like such a similar thing where there's such a trust involved and not wrestling to like make something happen, you know, and, and trusting the Lord and trusting our husband, you know, as I don't know, that's something I've just been continually learning and growing in. And there's always blessing in it, you know, and it's like, I think at least for me, I feel as a woman, I know when I am like wanting to overstep and there's just like this check you know in my heart like nope like that is the wrong route i will not bless that you know like the lord doesn't bless that so um yeah 
but I, I get it, especially if you get a word from the Lord. And I wonder if she felt like she had to act on it, you know, like he told her this so that, okay, I'm telling you this so you can go do it. You know, I wonder if there was that dynamic for her um, that didn't get resolved in her own heart. Yeah, I think this is very reminiscent of what Sarah did just one generation before. So this is like, this is Rebecca's mother-in-law yeah. who, you know, gave her servant Hagar to Abraham because the promise God had made wasn't happening. And so she intervened and um, there are different scenarios and different people. So I'm not, not saying that they were, their hearts were in the same place but I'm just curious, you know, we see these women kind of stepping in and intervening and um, maybe messing things up. I don't know. And it, it takes me back to the fall. Um, you know, in Genesis 3, part of the curse is not just pain and childbirth, but that we will, our desire will be to rule over our husbands. Mm -hmm. And um, you see it playing out like a few chapters later in this story in multiple generations. The Family Plan Calendar is the new way to keep your family team organized. Plan your rhythms, menu, household chores, and notes for the family all in one place. Visit FamilyTeams.com to purchase. Yeah. 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 It, it seems that maybe another clue that the Another detail the story gives us is that she is totally miserable with her daughter-in-laws, right? So yeah. Esau has married these Hittite women yeah. and Rebecca's like, I want to die. Like, and so she's got a whole plan. And what's interesting is her scheme to create or allow for this crazy rift to happen between Esau and Jacob actually plays into like a larger plan that maybe she has to get Jacob to marry somebody from her own tribe. How is he going to do that? Well, he's mm -hmm. got to somehow get to her family mm -hmm. and they live, you know, hundreds of miles away. And so he basically, this huge rift that's sort of inevitable. I mean, what did you think was going to happen? Right. I mean, if you, there's only, there's only a scenario in which he's trying to steal the blessing and then Esau catches him red handed or he successfully steals the blessing. Either way, Esau is going to want revenge or there's, it's going to create a, a massive rift between the brothers. There's already a huge rift, but it's going to get much worse. And so, yeah, to your point, April, it does seem like there's a lot of manipulation. Um, mm -hmm. But the, narr the narrator is, the, uh, is providing for us all kinds of, you know, ways in which this is playing out to, uh, to align with the plans of God. You see this as well mm -hmm. with, um, the story of Joseph, right? The, the author of Genesis is constantly giving us examples, right? Where, you know, Joseph has these, has these dreams about all of his siblings bowing down to him. How is that ever going to happen? Well, it happens because his siblings hate him so much that his brothers sell, sell him into slavery. And, you know, years and years and years later, they end up bowing down to him when he's in Egypt. And so the, the original prophecy gets fulfilled through the sin of humanity. And one of the things that, that you have an epilogue in Genesis, which I think really relates to this story as well. And that's when Joseph says to his brothers, what man meant for evil, because they, they start freaking out after Jacob dies, they, they think that they're going to be killed by Joseph because they had sold him into slavery. And Joseph comforts them by saying, what what you meant for evil, God meant for good, for the salvation of many lives. And so is that true in this story? Like what Rebecca meant, like, is you, you can't say in this Joseph story that the brothers had the best of motives. Like the story makes clear that their motives were not pure, yet God used their um, sinful action to bring about his divine plan. And so you have something similar going on here, it seems like right, with Rebecca, like it's not as clear uh, but it does seem like if you look at the details of the story, her motives are more self-centered than God-centered and, mm -hmm. but God's using them to mm -hmm. bring about his, his sovereign plan. 
One one way I've really had to wrestle with these um, matriarchs, the four matriarchs, is because every Shabbat, part of what we do is I bless my daughters with Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Mm -hmm. and Leah. And I'm like, what am I doing? What am I... What am I passing on to Sarah, the one who usurped God's promise and took it mm. upon herself to, and Rebecca, the one who, you know, so I I really don't uh, have like a cut and dry black and white answer. And what I feel like I'm passing on to my daughters is like some, some of it is this reality of being a human. And like my desire is to, like my fleshly desire is to like pass perfection on to my kids. Like I want them to be perfect and they won't ever have to struggle and they won't ever have to like, you know, figure something out. They'll just do everything right. And so um, like submitting the idea that I am blessing my daughters with these women of old who um, knew somehow of God and were um, in their flesh and then back in, you know, however that worked back then where they were listening to God and then taking things into their own hands and back and forth, how they were real people and they were um, running households and, you know, making the, like running alongside their husbands in these like real leadership positions and um, involved in the understanding of generational living and the ways that generations would be impacted and, um, you know, and not just off doing their own thing, but like somehow involved. And so even though they were these fallen human women, just that they were named, that we know so much about them, that we can really kind of wrestle um, with what we do know about them. I think it's it's a type of gift that we're giving, like pa- blessing our girls with to as they step into generational living and running households and either they can use it as a what's it called when it's like an example of what not to do um there's a phrase cautionary for that that tale. a cautionary tale or if it's like or be like this woman you know so i think it's even just like the infertility issues that uh they both like sarah and rebecca and Rachel and Leah, they all have this in different times and like trusting the Lord with your womb and like all of these struggles that we get to see through all four of them. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, I think they, may God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel and Leah. Yeah, part of what it seems like we're saying, we can't be saying these are, these are matriarchs who are flawless and therefore be flawless like them. Um, the patriarchs and the matriarchs all have major flaws in Genesis. Um, but I think that part of what it seems like we want is for the will of God to happen. Like God seemed to work in spite of them and through Mm -hmm. them and he loved them and he cared for them. And, and so he provided fertility, you know, in multiple cases, I mean, there was fertility issues with Sarah, with Rebecca, um, and with, um, Mm -hmm. Rachel. Right. Um, and then ultimately with all of the things they were trying to do, trying to accomplish God, his sovereign will was happening through them. And this, this story is, I think we're really, a really vivid example of that. Like Rebecca is, is just clearly scheming. And the deeper we go into the story, the more, to me, it does look like she's doing it for more personal reasons. And, um, and she's lifted up as this honored matriarch you know, in the Bible. I had a thought. I had that same thought too, April. Well, I was just reading this earlier and it's like, I'm praying this over my daughters, but I had this thought and you too, Brittany. I had this thought though, because we say that same prayer um, in our Shabbat meal. But the next part is, may he give, give you the heart of Ruth, the faith of Mary and the righteousness of Christ as you build our family from generation to generation. And I was thinking of how, after in that blessing we named those matriarchs there's now ruth who that ended really well like god redeemed her her situation and then with the faith of mary it's almost i don't know i've never thought of this so correct me if i'm wrong on this but 
there's almost a redeeming of what um, Rebecca said or how she reacted to the word of the Lord here. Because when Mary heard the word of the Lord, she responded with, may it be to, uh, what was it? May it be to me as you say. And but and she didn't meddle with any of it. Like she stayed very submitted. I don't know. I don't know if that's a connection, but um, and then it ends with the righteousness of Christ. So I don't know, kind of a cool redemption with that. Yes. Yeah, that's good. I just I agree, Michelle. I think that's a really neat it. I wonder um how like the Hebraic mind juxtaposes the counterparts that you're that you're kind of drawing there that's that's really interesting there's there's a, something she says here that really strikes me i'm curious what you guys think so she uses very commanding language multiple times in the story mm -hmm. like she tells jacob to obey her um mm -hmm. she's commanding him as if she has real authority over him and Ooh. then she says um to him when when he says well what you know what'll, what'll happen if i get caught and then my father starts to curse me and Rebecca says, let the curse fall on me. Um, it's just interesting. Like I, I'm trying to like really think through the implications or what that says about the story or about the character of Rebecca, that she is very much taking authority. She can't take authority in like at the very end where she's in this conversation with Isaac about how miserable she is with her daughter-in-laws. But it's interesting that with, within her relation with Jacob, she does take authority and then she wants the curse to fall on her. Um, I, I don't know if that's even a possibility, but yeah. Um, what are we learning about Rebecca and how, yeah, what, what, what does that make you, what kind of, what does that stir up for any of you about, about this character and what she does, what she's doing there in the story? Gosh, my nature is just to read it and be like, I had a woman, bad dog. <laughs> But the scripture keeps coming to mind, and I can't recall where it is. We're studying Revelation, so it's got to be in there. Um, but I know it's all throughout the Bible. God searches the hearts, and God knows where it is. And so it's so easy for me to look at her and just like, girl, chill. <laughs> but what, what we don't see in this narrative is, was there further conversation between her and the Lord, right? Like, to rebuttal almost what I said earlier, like, we don't know if the Lord is like, and I'm going to use you, right? That part wasn't written down. Oh. So I just think the Lord knows her heart. And for a mom to fight so fiercely, I have to believe that she had a pure heart. But then the story does reek up me, 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 and selfishness. So it's so hard to, like, draw the line and say, this is, you know, I love stories like this because it makes you, it's that gray matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it feels like for her to say, like, let the curse be on me, there is something there that is either, that that she believes so deeply that she is willing to say something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a hard time understanding the whole blessings and curse thing because it's like kind of, I don't know, maybe ethereal or something like that, but I feel like it was so real to them. And we see it in this story how Isaac's like, I can't take it back. I've already given it. It's like, well, wow. can't you just say the same words again? Like what's, you didn't like give him something that he can't physically get back from him. Like, why can't you just say it again? Um, so there's something going on in the like blessing curse world that is really hard for, I think like our Western modern minds to really understand and so for her to say that makes me think there is something that she's believing very, very deeply. Like she's taking a huge risk to say that even if it goes to that point of him cursing you, I'm willing to, I'll take that on. Like, let that be on me, but you need to do this. Which to me denotes that she she's believing something really deeply. So if mm -hmm. it's back to that, like, God spoke to me and I was pregnant with you and this is what he said and I'm sticking to it even if your stubborn father's not listening. Like, I don't know if it's that kind of thing or if she's like, I really want this to work out with my the, my uh, you know family of origin. I think this is the best way for it to go. I have my own plan and I'm willing to like die for it. 
Um, I don't know which way it is, but it's just like she had to believe something really deeply to be able to to say that. Yeah. So given this story or what we've kind of teased out so far about Rebecca, you're talking to a modern um, mother, you know, in our day and thinking about her role or her s- struggles or challenges in light of Rebecca's story. Yeah. Any, any uh, applications that kind of come to mind? Mm-hmm. Um, like what, what, what would it look like for us to try to understand as we've wrestled with the details of the story, what would you encourage a, a wife and mother to do or not to do um, based on what we're seeing in this narrative? I'm still a really young mom. My oldest is only 11. But um, I can be very strong sometimes, and I have to have a whoa, chill out conversation with myself. And there was um, a scenario, and I felt like the Lord was like, shut your mouth and crave at it, because then I will get the glory, not you. Mm-hmm. And I told Michael, I'm like learning how to be a good mother-in-law. I'm like, I just left my chicken and stuff. Yeah, I'm just really snuffed later down the road. Yeah. Um, but that would be my encouragement. Right. Let's be quiet. Let's make sure the Lord gets the glory and that we're not trying to meddle or weasel out our, our hopes and desires. Let's step back and really let the Lord work. I, th- I think one thing that like really strikes me as we look at the story this time is what a disaster the favoritism was. Mm-hmm. Or Esau and Jacob, um, Esau was too masculine. It seems like in the story, like Rebecca didn't seem to really, she, he doesn't really seem capable of taking on teachings from his mother, right? Like there, there's a, there's a really sad disconnect between Esau and Rebecca. And there seems to be a similar unfortunate disconnect between Jacob and Isaac. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and it, it feels like it's inevitable because I think both boys are like, well, I've got my parent who's, it's almost like they both were raised by single parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of really a balance between the two, I don't know if you've ever seen this in a family, but that, that doesn't seem like a healthy thing. Um, that there is, and, and the story, it's, it's so strong and so pronounced. It's just obvious. And the story points it out. Like one, mm-hmm. you know, loved the, you know, and, and they, they slotted in and it, and it was for really pretty superficial reasons, right? Um, they could relate. Isaac could relate really well with Esau because he's this man in the field and Rebecca got to spend a lot more time with Jacob because he was hanging around by the tents and that's the relationship just got strong and and the other relationship must have gotten completely weak and and it does seem to be at the detriment of both boys. Yeah, yeah I, we didn't really get into this very much, but I would say um, to learn a lot about like the mother-son relationship in these, in this story from the story because you can see both kind of like a um maybe a mama's boy and then maybe a like I'm too cool for my mom yeah. guy I don't know so just thinking about um our role as as mother to a son it's different than a mother to a daughter and so acknowledging those differences and um being aware that there are pitfalls um, there's a desire to make your son's life easier or, um, you know, fix all his owies when he's little. And then it's hard to make that go away as they're growing up and making decisions around you, um, letting him fall and pick himself back up kind of a thing is, can, can be hard for a mom to do. And so, um, finding that balance between that and, and like, that maybe the rough shoulder, like you're on your own, figure it out. Um, how how to maintain that like desire to um, be a maternal influence and like like a a place where they can come for comfort, but then also go back out to tackle the world's problems and the things that the Lord's putting on their shoulders. It's good. Awesome. Well, thank you all for jumping on this. I, I love getting a chance just to. Um, really think through and let these stories kind of like live inside of us um, and just ponder and wrestle with the implications. I mean, these are like, these are such meta stories. Like we're supposed to, I think really, they shape the way that we think about these roles so deeply. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it, they, they don't do it in a very simplistic way. It's, it's complex. And because it's so complex, I think it requires just the time and attention to like sit down, look at the details, discuss the details and wrestle together through them. So thank you all for uh, wrestling through the story and the character of Rebecca. This has uh, been a good conversation. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.